Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to CSIS, and it's uh, great to see you all here, and welcome to our online audience as well. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cook. I direct the Africa program here at CSIS, and I'm very pleased to be um, uh, organizing in conjunction with the U.S. Um, Institute for uh, the Commission for International Religious Freedom uh, today's session on uh, violent extremism, religious extremism in Africa, uh, and looking at very respo uh, various responses on that. Um, through the course of the next few months, uh, the Commission and CSIS will be hosting a small series of off-the-record roundtables, but uh, each one looking at different models, uh, different places, different interlocutors, and promising models, what have been missing uh, from uh, some of the endeavors uh, to counter uh, extremist ideologies um, within Africa. We don't have Africans at the table today. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Ambassador of Niger, uh, Madame Halidou, uh, is, was unable to join us. We hope we'll have her at a later session. She's uh, a really fantastic woman and very much devoted to this issue and to the critical issue of uh, education in all of this. Um, but today we're really delighted to have, uh, to lead us off here, Dr. Sarah Sewell, who is the Undersecretary for Civil Security, Democracy, and Human Rights at the U.S. State Department. Um, Dr. Sewell has done previous work at the Harvard Kennedy School um, as director of the Carr Center for Human Rights, incredibly prestigious center, uh, and uh, the program on human rights and national security. Um, she was a member of the Defense Policy Board, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Peacekeeping and Humanitarian Assistance in the Clinton administration, uh, worked for uh, Senate Majority Leader George Mitchell, and was an Oxford uh, scholar um, uh, some time back. Um, Dr. Sewell has been one of those voices within the State Department that has been um, uh, persistent and consistent in um, making sure uh, that this issue of countering violent extremism remains uh, on the radar screen it, it can be very easy to devolve quickly into kind of security measures when you're talking about the Sahel or East Africa or the Horn. Um, I'm not saying that those are easy, but the much more difficult part of all of this is in changing uh, the, uh, the, the social norms and the social interactions and the thinking and the hearts and minds and, and the grievances and frustrations of many of the young populations who are drawn into some of these movements. And it's critically important um, that, uh, particularly for the United States, not to kind of reinforce in partner governments' minds that that idea that really this is a military situation. And I think you have been really one of the voices that has, has, has kept that up um, uh, and, and, and made that uh, very clear to uh, U.S. partners in the fight against this. I would like to turn to you. Um, Dr. Sewell has agreed to offer a keynote, open, uh, uh, open up for some questions, and then, uh, then we will turn to a panel uh, with Terry Ostabo, who is from the University of Florida, Department of Religion, Department of African Affairs, Department of Islam, he keeps adding programs and departments there, <laughs> and Tiffany Lynch, who is a senior uh, ad advisor at the U.S. Commission for International Freedom. But first, we're going to turn to Dr. Sewell uh, and then open it up from questions uh, from you all. So welcome, and welcome, Dr. Sewell. We're really delighted to have you. Thanks, Jennifer, very, very much. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Thank you, Richard and Ben, and the terrific teams at CSIS and at the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom for bringing us together today. As you probably know, we at the State Department rely on CSIS. IS's world-class research and analysis to help us look around the corner and make sense of emerging issues. Um, so I'm really pleased that you have, in conjunction uh, with the Commission, taken on this really interesting uh, topic of religious extremism in Africa. As the, the project title implies, policymakers need to better understand both how religion affects issues of security and stability, 
but equally important, how to encourage and reinforce nonviolent, tolerant expressions of faith in their role in the public life, the social fabric, and the political uh, dialogue. So while so much of global attention has focused on Syria and Iraq, when we think about religious extremism and violent extremism, that's what comes to most people's minds. In fact, regionally motivated, religiously motivated uh, violent extremism is on the rise in Africa. And as will be familiar to many of you as Africa experts, it's not limited to one part of the continent. It's East Africa, it's West Africa, it's the Sahel, it's the Maghreb. And so this is a really vitally important, if still understudied topic, and thank you for, for taking it on. I'd like to start at the beginning by simply stating the obvious, which is that freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, are bedrock principles of the U.S. experience and of U.S. foreign policy. And the United States favors no particular faith, and within our own borders, we, of course, embrace all religions. And U.S. policy abhors the use of any ideology, not just a religious ideology, to justify violence or to violate universal rights. And U.S. policy also rejects the claim that specific religions are the cause of terrorism. As President Obama has repeatedly stated, we are not at war with Islam. We are at war with the people who have perverted Islam. So in Africa and around the world, religion propels many people to do inspiring good. In my work as Under Secretary, one of the greatest privileges I've had is meeting people who have, from all religious traditions, been central to advancing um, the health and the strength and the vitality of their own communities. It was last March when I traveled to Zanzibar, a small island off the coast of Tanzania, and when I was there, as I often do, I met with representatives from different local faith communities. This meeting had a particular impact on me because it was in this discussion that I learned what acid does to a human being's face. Um, Sheikh Zaroga is more than a local imam in Zanzibar. He's really an institution there. He won people's respect not through fiery sermons, but through tireless, thankless work for people in the community, connecting the unemployed to jobs, mentoring aimless youth, preaching tolerance and respect. And his face was really the face of Islam, positive, hopeful, peaceful. When attackers hurled acid at him, they really shook the community to its core. Extremist violence had come to Zanzibar in the last couple of years seeking to terrorize people in the name of the same religion that the community had practiced for centuries. Sheikh Zaraga's faith was being perverted and rebranded. And elsewhere in Africa, violent extremism is linked to purported religious tenets. Some examples, Boko Haram abducting young girls who have the audacity to want to learn, the Lord's Resistance Army enslaving children to carry out horrific acts, rogue followers of traditional religions attacking people with albinism to traffic their body parts, and homophobic vitriol spouted in some churches and mosques has inspired mobs to murder gay people in the streets of Abuja, Kampala, and elsewhere. So many violent extremists harness religious claims to cloak their depravity and to inspire and recruit followers. And sadly, acts of violence in the name of religion are as old as religion itself, and they persist in communities around the world, from so-called honor killings to wife burnings. But today, what we see in the manifestation of these trends is novel and dangerous. It's the rise of organized, heavily armed, non-state actors that justify violence and territorial ambitions with religious ideologies. Groups like Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, and the LRA, Lord's Resistance Army. And these groups threaten Africa's every achievement and aspiration, from economic growth to women's rights, health care, and education. And for Africa's future and for global security, they must be defeated. <clears throat> 
Now that begins with understanding what allowed these groups to take root and to spread. And obviously, uh, we can't ignore the influence of violent religious ideologies that inflame passions and dehumanize the other. Al-Shabaab and Boko Haram, for example, both justify their brutality in twisted interpretations of Salafism. Many Al-Shabaab leaders were indoctrinated in ultra-conservative religious schools in the Middle East. The LRA's purported faith entails a warped version of the Ten Commandments that it seeks to impose on others. So when these groups repeatedly invoke religion to spill blood and inspire followers, we can't pretend that religion has no role. But obviously, uh, as was said at the outset, our, our analysis cannot stop there because the story is far more complex and that's really what we look forward to this joint work between CSIS and the Commission to further unpacking. We know that many other factors play a role in spurring people to violence or making them susceptible to violent ideologies, including religious ideologies. And these factors are unique to local circumstances, but they will also likely reflect broad themes that we have seen globally. Marginalization, poor or abusive governance, limited opportunity, feelings of discontent and dislocation. AQIM, for example, exploited feelings of marginalization across northern Mali to establish new outposts of terror. Most of Boko Haram's followers hail from the historically neglected regions of northern Nigeria. Political and economic exclusion among the ethnic Akoli helped spark the LRA in northern Uganda. And in many parts of Africa, vast ungoverned territories provide violent extremists areas to train, recruit, or tax. So deep in the forests of Central Africa, the LRA and Boko Haram are free to sustain their evil. And they have safe havens from which to strike and wreak havoc on communities before melting away to recover and strike again. Government, government incompetence and abuse also fans extremist violence. In East and West Africa, corruption allows extremists to cast themselves as pious alternatives. In Somalia, years of anarchy in the 1990s led some to welcome al-Shabaab's promise of security and rule of law. Unlawful and excessive force by government, often in the name of security, can empower factions arguing that violence is the only option left to change their plight. After the former Nigerian's government spate of police brutality and extrajudicial killings, Boko Haram escalated its campaign of terror. And similarly, alleged abuses by the Ethiopian military in Somalia elevated al-Shabaab by allowing the group to tout itself as a defender of the faithful. Violent extremists are also abetted by the more recent trends linked to globalization, like proliferation of information and communications technology, which gives them new platforms to cultivate followers connect otherwise distant sympathizers and recruit beyond areas of physical contact. And violent extremists are obviously uh, benefiting from rapid population growth and industrialization across Africa, leaving countless people, especially young people, uh, unmoored from villages, seeking work in teeming cities, and trying to make sense of their new place in a new economic and social order, an unfamiliar one. So adrift in these rapid changes, violent ideologies promising purpose, community, and identity find appeal. Compounding the problem, extreme weather events made worse by climate change add to experiences of dis dislocation and economic dislocation and discontent. So all of these factors help in a broad sense to explain the emergence of violent extremist groups. And they raise serious alarm about the vulnerability of many communities across Africa that are struggling directly with these issues, especially as Daesh seeks new footholds for expansion on the continent. The United States stands with Africans to prevent the spread of extremist violence. Across the continent, but especially in East Africa and the Sahel, the U.S. is training and equipping foreign militaries, sharing intelligence, and supporting police to enhance border security. These are the more well-known and central elements of our counterterrorism approach in Africa. But it's critical, and I want to spend a few moments uh, talking about 
the newer and equally vital, but still emerging, complement to the counterterrorism approach, which we call countering violent extremism, or CVE. Counterterrorism focuses on existing extremist threats. Countering violent extremist extremism seeks to prevent the next generation of threats from emerging. CVE emphasizes governance, elevating issues of rights in the counterterrorism partnership. And it calls on governments to embrace a do no harm approach, which means working with security and police forces to end impunity for abuses, embedding public institutions with mechanisms for transparency, and reforming prisons to separate petty criminals from violent ideologues. Engagement around CVE tenants works. After months of outreach by U.S. Diplomats, diplomats, the police chief of Mombasa in Kenya began to openly question whether the practice of widespread indiscriminate roundups was in fact compounding the problem of violent extremism that he faced. The county commissioner of Mombasa told us, we're trying to stop being firefighters. Encouraging that shift, though, can be hard, because in the wake of extremist violence, Governments and citizens want quick results and tough shows of force. And this makes it easier to revert into the often negative patterns of overreaction that can compound the problem one is seeking to solve. Now, countries must push back against violent propaganda that extremists use to twist vulnerable minds and pull communities into their orbit. Part of that work is involves using these new tools that have exacerbated the spread of violent extremism in the first place. That can include partnering with the tech community to disrupt extremist incitements to violence on the internet, flagging contents or accounts tied to known terrorists. But it can also mean helping amplify the voices of mainstream religious leaders to denounce the faith as an insult to the deepest tenets of true faith. Up to 90% of Africans say religion is very important in their lives. Thank you for that factoid. Um, and this gives African religious leaders enormous influence. We can help better equip those leaders to use that influence by training imams to use Facebook, Twitter, or text messaging to reach a wider audience. We can help behind the scenes promote interfaith dialogue to address sectarian tensions that inflame calls for violence. And we can certainly encourage other governments, like Morocco, which has a terrific regional initiative to train imams coming from all over the continent, Gabon, Guinea, Kenya, Mali, and Nigeria, um, to help, help these uh, religious clerics refute the violent perversions of Islam on, um, with, with confidence in terms of their interpretations of texts. Now, these steps are all important, but alone they're insufficient because violent ideologies and propaganda resonate with people for a variety of reasons. It's not the ideology itself. It's who is drawn to that ideology and why they are drawn. Um, these ideologies may resonate because they offer um, a variety of different needs that are likely to be unique to local circumstance and certainly unique to the individual person. So we can't simply refute or ask others with more moral authority or authenticity or um, connections to the community uh, refute what violent extremists are offering to the vulnerable. We have to actually address some of those vulnerabilities or help people address some of those vulnerabilities themselves, um, to take more empowering and affirming steps to protect the vulnerable. And this really is, is, there is a role for government, but fundamentally this is a community-focused activity. It's about uh, supporting communities to unleash their own potential and find their own sources of resilience. Um, the voids that violent extremists try to fill are best tackled in town halls, schools, and families. Governments that stifle civil society and sideline communities, uh, sometimes in the name of, again, security and control, can unwittingly sap the very power of the, the most promising actors 
in protecting the vulnerable at the local level. And so governments, again, coming back to do no harm, need to lift any restrictions that they have on civil society and make sure that um, there is the freedom to both communicate and act at the local level along the lines of uh, CVE tenants. Now here again, religious institutions can play a vital role. And in Africa, especially where states are very weak in performing core government functions, it's often religious institutions that fill that void, whether it's providing education or employment or even financing directly to the vulnerable. And these roles can certainly be important in curbing radicalism. CVE recognizes this and calls for active engagement with religious communities, not just religious leaders who are often overwhelmingly male and not especially young, um, but also seeking to engage those from the communities who aren't the, trust, the crusty authority figures, people like classmates, sisters, and peers, and finding ways to engage with other young people in the context, in the umbrella, the cocoon of a faith community. Women, too, can play a vital role in or outside of a faith community. Uh, African women hold very few formal leadership roles in faith communities, but they're often very active members of the church and play informal leadership roles in their communities. And when women's rights and status come under attack, it's often foreshadowing a broader shift toward radicalization and violence that should alert us to uh, the potential for um, wider mobilization. I remember hearing the anguish of one woman uh, from a Muslim community in Tanzania and she was lamenting that she could barely recognize her faith in the weekly sermon because the tone had grown so hardline and exclusionary. And sure enough, this was a community that uh, was in the process of becoming uh, more radicalized um, and ultimately creating real challenges. Finally, CVE emphasizes strengthening ties between African governments and the communities that they serve, things that we take for granted constituency outreach by local officials, town halls, conversations between police departments and the neighborhoods they protect. These are uncommon throughout Africa. And in their absence, it's harder to build cooperation and trust between citizens and government. By contrast, obviously, when there's dialogue, when people come together, it's harder for the violent groups to paint the picture of the enemy because the state itself is known and is familiar and there is a relationship. So that can be extraordinarily powerful for the state. And the same principle um, holds true within communities themselves. The more there is dialogue around a problem, the less likely outsiders will be able or extremists will be able to characterize um, individuals or institutions as enemies. For example, when dozens of young Kenyans were arrested last year for links to violent extremism, the parents, police, and imams came together to develop a solution. The children were released, but on the condition that their parents vouched for their behavior and that they attended weekly religious instruction. So it was cooperation, trust, and a little creativity by the community that put these kids on a better path and saved dozens of young lives from languishing in jail where they may well have been uh, recruited to a fuller status in a violent extremist group. So that's what the community level can do and why it can be effective. Over the last two years, the US government has helped lead a shift toward this more localized and preventive approach to violent extremism. Secretary Kerry empowered the Bureau of Counterterrorism and Countering Violent Extremism to embed this broader approach in the US government's work, and in May, the State Department and USAID released their first ever joint CVE strategy outlining how to unite diplomatic and development tools. We've also stood up a global engagement center that spearheads uh, the messaging effort seize, to seize the initiative in the battle for vulnerable hearts and minds, primarily by working through more authentic non-governmental voices. And in East Africa, I'm very proud of the pilot CVE programs that we've launched that I hope will serve as a model for global CVE programming going forward through the CTPF, the Counterterrorism Partnership Fund process. What I had found when I had traveled through Africa was that we had 
a variety of programs sort of scattered across the continent that were not connected to one another and didn't have sort of a strong theory of the case, but they were branded as CVE programs. What we've done with the East Africa pilot is uh, come together across our government to pool funds, to conduct extensive research collaboratively uh, across the State Department and USAID, working with posts to develop a common diagnosis of the problem, the threats, the vulnerabilities, and then designing a truly integrated program that focuses on key priority areas. It doesn't try to do everything, but in those areas, it takes a tailored approach um, to address the specific forces driving radicalism, radicalization to violence in the places that had been identified as most vulnerable. And so this is really a, a, a breakthrough in terms of how the U.S. government thinks about the problem and uh, pulls disparate actors together to provide more coherent solutions. It's early in phase yet. The programming has not uh, begun in full, but it is um, so far exceeded our expectations in terms of um, the, the level of excitement that we have about the ability to show the effect of CVE programming. Because it's targeted, holistic, and research-driven work that we need to be doing in a world where there is so much risk of uh, extremism, we need to be very careful about how we prioritize those efforts, and we want to be able to show how and why those efforts have impact. At the global level, the State Department is helping foreign governments, international NGOs, and multilateral bodies help establish CVE strategies as well as counter-messaging centers, other institutions to share best practices. The United Nations has also taken up this cause. Um, the, the UN Secretary General developed a comprehensive uh, preventing violent extremism plan of action. Individual UN agencies such as UNESCO um, and UNDP have mobilized, for example, to help teachers um, prevent radicalization to violence with specific tools and curriculum, or helping African governments undertake uh, CVE programs through development assistance. Just last month, the UN General Assembly endorsed recommendations for member states to strengthen their efforts. And this suggests that the, the broader approach, the preventive approach, the holistic approach, the positive approach that we have sought to articulate and now pilot within the US government is, in fact, taking hold internationally, although it is early days yet. Uh, but these holistic uh, uh, responses to the drivers and sources of violent extremism are really critical if we are to avoid constantly relying on military tools and reacting after the fact to violence. Um, CVE efforts recognize the limits of government, but they also recognize the responsibilities of government. And as I said, they bring governance and rights to the core of the counterterrorism conversation where they really have not been in the past. And this can create uh, tensions and difficult conversations, but very important conversations that have to be ha happening as we seek to help partners understand how state actions can inadvertently exacerbate violent extremism. We do have to be clear-eyed about the challenges, though. I've painted, um, I've made the argument for why CVE is an important um, new dimension of uh, American and international thinking and policy. Um, but I want to offer a few uh, cautions as well. Um, first, it takes time to change harmful government practices, to strengthen public institutions, and to repair trusts between communities that have long been neglected um, by the state. Second, there's no guarantee that research can fully disentangle the complex drivers of violent extremism. Clearly, it's central to better use of resources, but we don't yet have the perfect formula down. And it's, again, one of the reasons why I think the work that you're going to be taking on is so important. Um, in addition, and to my dismay, some international actors, particularly in the humanitarian sphere, uh, sometimes appear reluctant to adapt their programming to address violent extremism as an issue, even as violent extremists threaten everything that humanitarians work for. 
from women's health and empowerment to economic development to human rights. Um, so we have a little bit of a, a, a culture clash uh, within that world to address. Perhaps most importantly, resources remain limited. Last year, the United States spent less than $200 million on programs that we could describe as CVE uh, programs worldwide. And it's less than the cost of a, a one F-22 fighter jet. It's, it's difficult to explain the magnitude of this problem. Um, you know, the, the, when you think about the level of attention that terrorism garners and the devastation that it inflicts globally, there is still an unfathomable gap between what the world spends to combat existing threats uh, and what it spends to prevent them. So we're in the right direction, but we still have a long way to go. And as you all know, foreign assistance itself is not um, a limitless resource lacking a constituency. And within that realm, prevention work is sometimes the hardest to gain political support for because um, when something doesn't happen, it's harder to put your name on it and take credit. But this is all um, to say that strengthening monitoring and evaluation is really important, both the research at the front end and the evaluation on the back end. And we're very encouraged that bodies as diverse as the World Bank, the World Economic Forum, and the African Development Bank are starting to lend their expertise into this area so that we can better make the case for these investments. There are also challenges in identifying and finding the right local partners on the ground. Local groups and leaders with the greatest influence over the very demographic or, or communities that are most vulnerable are, are often very different partners than those with whom the development community or the State Department, for that matter, traditionally works. Um, and that creates challenges in terms of identifying those partners. And those partners may not always want to work with uh, other governments or receive funding from other governments. And additionally, the current law that prohibits material support for known terrorists can inadvertently prevent us from assisting those who are best positioned to help us prevent the spread of violent extremism. So the, the group Kenya Supcom um, de-radicalizes and rehabilitates Al-Shabaab fighters. And their work is essential for peeling off the faltering supporters and creating powerful voices to refute Al-Shabaab's lies. But under existing law, uh, SUPCHEM would have to exhaustively itemize every single expense to confirm that U.S. funds provided no direct assistance to former Al-Shabaab fighters. And that's simply not how this organization is set up to function. Um, and of course, those best positioned on the ground rarely have the means for reporting, budgeting, or administration that will allow them to apply for and, and administer international funding. So we have to look closely at these very practical issues as well to, to figure out how to better partner with third parties uh, locally on the ground. Um, and I want to put in a plug here for the Global Community Engagement and Resilience Fund, which is now piloting programs in Nigeria, Mali, and soon Kenya, um, because they are seeking to do just that in a global consortium that can receive funding from a variety of sources. One of the other ways in which we're seeking to help strengthen communities is through networks of communities. So for example, the RESOLVE network, which stands for Researching Solutions to Violent Extremism, connects, bless you, local researchers who are studying the drivers of violent extremism in their communities and connects them to um, national and international organizations that can partner with them. We've also helped launch the Strong Cities Network that can help municipalities, um, cities in Kenya, Senegal, and Mauritania share lessons about what works and what doesn't work in identifying and responding to violent extremism. So both at the government level, at the community level, and at the level of individuals and networks globally, we've been trying to, to build support for this broad new preventive approach. And this is really a struggle to protect communities across Africa. Um, I consider it humanitarian work in its purest form because the damage wrought by violent extremism is measures not simply in the blood that the extremists spill, but the investments they deter, the textbooks they burn, the women and girls that they enslave, and the vast human potential 
that they squander. And it's really important to have met people like Sheikh Zaraga because it's really easy to look at the scope of the problem and think, my goodness, you know, how do we start? How do we make a dent? But, you know, he is, he is an example of extraordinary resilience. And even after Assad mutilated his face and terrorized his community, he insisted on tolerance and on respect and on continuing to build peace. And he was hungry for answers as to why this was happening, and he committed himself to, to answering those questions. And we have to stand with him and with leaders across Africa who are struggling to do the same thing on behalf of their communities and to protect the soul of their religious beliefs. And at the same time, we have to reject framing the problem of violent extremism solely as one of religious ideology. Not simply because this pits religions against one another, but because it misses that broader picture that I, I just um, imposed upon you. It needlessly it limits what we can do if we think of it as just a problem of religion. We know individuals are not born hating and violent, and they become so for a series of complex reasons, some ideological, but personal, communal, and structural. And so where violent religious movements operate, we're not powerless to prevent their spread, even if there are limits to what we can do. Um, much of what we do to avert violent extremism is also worth pursuing on its own, uh, giving people a stake in their community and greater confidence in their future, ending government abuses and improving basic education and health services. These are within our grasp. These are practices that we can change, steps we can take, debates we can and must win on behalf of the most vulnerable communities across the globe. So the complexity of the threat while it invites your attention, um, it's not a call for complacency, but it's a call for all of us who care about Africa's future to roll up our sleeves and get to work. So thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much. We're going to take um, uh, some questions before you depart. Um, yeah, that was... Uh, very comprehensive uh, kind of view of the many dimensions that feed into this. Um, in terms of the next administration uh, uh, coming in, um, where are the areas that you see in your position that you would like much greater investment um, to happen? Um, do you think we're getting the balance right um, even within the non-military side of uh, our, our efforts to counter violent extremism? Um, or are there areas that kind of uh, irk you that we're not doing a bit more? Well, irk is a strong word okay, for irk, a government yes, official. Sorry, yes, yeah. um, but what, <laughs> what I can say, Jennifer, is that, is that, that there's, a, there's a macro problem that I described, which is the imbalance of resources. Then within, um, even when we think about preventive measures, we've got very different sort of types of challenges. We have sort of frontline states that are dealing with refugees and potential violent extremism in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, I mean, in most continents. And the, the proximity of the threat and the scale of the challenge and the degree of existing resources varies. In my judgment, the potential for the, the threat to spread in Africa um, suggests to me that we should be devoting additional resources in the prevention work in Africa. Because in the Middle East, we are already in a place where we are engaged in fighting a war. And we do have uh, armed conflicts in Africa, some of which uh, directly engage either US or partner or international forces. Um, but there's a lot of important prevention work to be done there. So I wouldn't want to suggest that we should stop doing anything that we're already doing. But I think it's really important that we have more resources. And when we have more resources, I think a significant amount of them um, could be fruitfully uh, used in Africa. 
It strikes me just from a, a, an event we've had here recently on, on elections in Zanzibar, and sorry if anyone was here at the time, elections that were abruptly annulled and then rerun with the opposition boycotting. Uh, this on an island that's predominantly Muslim uh, with a population that is 60% uh, under 15 years old. Um, and it strikes me that uh, to, to just let that, that, let that happen, it kind of creates those very conditions of kind of this sense of enduring injustice. Um, uh, in a neighborhood where uh, extremist groups are in fact trying to uh, win over uh, recruits. And so, I mean, it says something too about, you know, how do we pursue our uh, robustly our democracy and governance and how do we reply to keen partners. Tanzania is one of our closest partners in, in assistance and it's always been something of a donor darling, but how do we have those hard conversations um, that this is not in their interest so in the long run um, either. The other case, and that's kind of a preventive case, the other place that will be interesting, I think, is uh, Nigeria right now, because with Boko Haram very much squeezed, we've got hundreds of uh, former Boko Haram members captured, hundreds of young women who have been captured uh, along with them, some of them initially sent for humanitarian uh, assistance, then, then uh, sent off to Giwa prison. Uh, nobody's quite sure what to do with some of these. We know that so many members of Boko Haram were really coerced into Boko Haram and didn't, uh, particularly after the death of Yusuf, didn't go for ideological purposes, but were, were coerced. But now that kind of whole transitional justice and what do you do, how do you, uh, how do you both serve uh, the members of families who have been brutalized by members of Boko Haram, and yet how do you not consign some of these very young fighters who may have been coerced in, into it uh, from spending the rest of their lives in a, in, in, in a very uh, uh, unhappy and uh, brutal prison life. And so I think there's an opportunity in, in a place like Nigeria where you have such a huge body of of people to actually examine, interrogate, and, and, and learn from, um, that I, I hope that the international community can encourage Nigeria to do so. They initially did have a kind of de-radicalization CVE program within the National Security uh, Agency, but that, to my knowledge, has been kind of uh, uh, cut off. But there, there are, I think, opportunities out there uh, for for big learning um, from, from some of these returnees. I agree, there's a I agree there's a lot of learning to be done in Nigeria, but, and Boko Haram's not defeated, but it is at least sort of on the move, a place if we're gonna sort of highlight areas that I think are of particularly acute concern. I would put Mali on that list. I, I was in Mopti, uh, you know, we all talk about northern Mali, but the center of the country is beginning to really fray and it's become sort of a, a you know, Mopti itself is now a little outpost uh, beyond which government officials cannot travel and there is no presence. And so I think, you know, we're at risk of, of, of losing um, Mali. And so, I, you know, that, there, there, there are just, there are a lot, of, there's a lot of preventive work that can be done in addition to work that can be done in places where we're, we're already um, seeing, you know, some progress and some populations that have come under protection. I think, you know, Nigeria, the big issue there is less CVE than it is, you know, government administration of the areas that they've liberated and the appalling lack of presence and services to those who have been, quote, unquote, liberated. So, but I, I would just flag Mali along in the yeah. same line. And I think there's all new network agreements that are coming up that, uh, that connect it. New networks of grievance uh, that make, would make a lot of sense for ambitious uh, extremists to want to tap into and mobilize. And I think that what's happening in central Mali, even the, the, the broader kind of pull, uh, Fulani farmer uh, attacks um, becoming something of a national or even regional network uh, are things to watch for. Let's take some questions from the audience. And we'll take one from the back there. 
Hi, thank you so much, Hilary Matfus with the Institute for Defense Analysis Africa team. Uh, I think it's really important what you've highlighted about how reactive some of our policies can be, particularly in, in CVE, even though it should be ultimately a, a preventative measure. So my question is, in terms of uh, work towards an early warning system, sort of like what we've seen surrounding the possibility of mass atrocities, uh, whether or not there's any work to develop the networks, the groundwork, and the metrics uh, to have in place throughout communities in sub-Saharan Africa an early warning system to identify potentially vulnerable areas for violent extremist groups. Thank you. Well, I don't know that we've gotten the, the atrocity prevention early warning networks down. Um, but I do think that you are 100 percent right to highlight the need for indicators to suggest when and where particular kinds of interventions are most hopeful. When I look at the scale of need out there, um, I do wonder, though, whether we need a fine, more fine-grained analysis or whether we simply need to act on what we already know. We know a fair amount, and there are some places that, as we were just discussing, you know, really do need attention for which we lack resources. So I, I would personally, if I were trying to prioritize do we need more awareness or do we need a, a of where the problems are emerging or do we need um, more resources for addressing those problems? My bias is toward the resources. Having said that, I think that there's a huge analytic need, but I think that analysis is more about what works than it is about where do we need it. Um, so those are, are my thoughts based on your question, but thank you for that. Gentlemen here. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leon Weinshop from the Foreign Service Retired. Uh, I was very encouraged to hear some remarks about working with groups such as even having a mom active on Facebook. However, I think we know that people are troubled and looking for an answer. They keep searching for someone who gives them the answer they want, whether it's a doctor, a lawyer, or a mom. Uh, however, since you, you did speak about a perversion of Islam, I think you were speaking about ISIS, or perhaps other groups uh, that might be covered by that, that as well. Would there be any value in seeking to encourage some authoritative voice? I don't know what that would be. Higher than a local amount, whether it would be from Saudi Arabia as, as a protector of the holy places, whether from Al Azhar University, some authoritative voice to supplement what is being mentioned at the community level to say these people, whether it's ISIS or other groups, are committing murder, not martyrdom. And, and somehow at such a level that they couldn't simply seek another imam who could give them the answer they want. Um, well, the Grand Mufti of Al Azhar has been has been very helpful in in some circumstances in debunking uh, allegations uh, with regard to Islamic tenets. Um, but of course, those institutions operate very independently, and uh, the 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 Saudi Wahhabist sources are generally speaking. Um, probably not going to provide the kind of alternative that your question implies you're seeking. Um, so the, what is, I think, the, been useful is that the intermediary bodies that have had regional roots, um, people of significant ex esteem, sort of individuals with, with particular esteem. Um, Liam, what's the name of the? Sheikh Abdullah bin Baya from Mauritania um, is one example. Uh, the Moroccan program, the Moroccan training program, where when these, when these regional uh, imams come, they are introduced into the whole sort of Moroccan theological system. And um, you know there are there are alternative uh, 
uh, there are, are alternatives to be found in different regions as well. But in Africa, um, right now, I think it's the Moroccans that are playing the key role in, in regional interpretations. But as you well appreciate, you know, the, the, the U.S. is not in a particular place to be dictating to uh, religious establishments what they do or say. And so I think the key there has been to find those figures that have had um, particularly uh, enlightening and salutary messages and doing what we can to direct other countries, other actors, other uh, religious networks to interact with those. Because too close an embrace can, of course, kill something. And so religion is definitely one of these areas in which, in the US experience, the requisite distance between the state and religious institutions um, suggests caution in how we think about it as an element of direct uh, engagement in our foreign policy. Um, in terms of getting more resources, do you think there are opportunities for public-private partnerships? And could you talk a little bit more about where you see those if you do? Sure. I mean, the some of the most interesting public-private partnerships that have been held to date in my experience, it doesn't mean that there aren't more, have revolved around things like tech camps and, and training. Um, so things having to do with technology where you can essentially provide people with different tools and platforms, and things that have to do with, with training in different ways that are important for running organizations or creating uh, networks and doing outreach. Those, I think, are terrific ways for public-private partnerships. But, for example, I think a really underexploited set of opportunities revolves around mentoring and economic development. So, for example, a lot of what uh, colleagues in AID work on are providing entrepreneurship training or providing uh, essential uh, vocational programs for youth. The private sector is clearly in the best position to, um, to articulate the paths to then apply the skills that are being trained. And so I think that's an area where, that can be done locally and it can be done internationally. Part of the challenge is that most of the companies with sort of really highly developed CS, corporate social responsibility antenna uh, tend to be um, in areas that are not necessarily going to be the areas in which people are being trained. But I think there is a lot more that business can do if it can be convinced to see its self-interest in doing that. And therefore, I think it's likely or more likely to be locally based businesses um, that do the economic empowerment linkages. But I think there's a lot that can be done on the tech side that can be done by outside bodies. I do think there's a, a lot to be said for kind of connecting people through markets and infrastructures. If you look at a lot of the places in the Sahel or Somalia or even northern Nigeria um, that have kind of been the, the places where they're, they're extremely isolated, A, or just infrastructurally isolated. In Gao, they get most of their food from Algeria, or from smuggled from Algeria because it's cheaper that way than from southern Mali. Uh, northeast uh, Niger Nigeria has very little interaction with the rest of Nigeria, uh, particularly lately, but uh, has cross-border connections and, and markets there. And I was looking at in the DHS of, of these various countries o over years, and in places like Difa or Lak in Chad or, or Timbuktu or Yoba, um, first of all, the uh, the lack of education, no education at all rates are so much higher than in the rest of the country, 85 in a place like um, Yobe, but also the lack of any access to any news whatsoever, whether radio, newspaper, or, um, or, or television, uh, or, or cell phones as well. And so kind of how do you begin to connect uh, communities in a way that makes them dependent on one another. They don't have to love each other, but if they're interdependent and invested in each other's success, 
and that's been a big, uh, uh, big thing for me as well. And one of the projects that we saw in, around Gao was really a local community, several of whom were extremely reformist, lots of tension between the very conservative and the less conservative. And OTI at that time was, was started a, a, a soccer match between them, which eventually evolved into weekly uh, banquets. Eventually women were involved. And I ran into somebody at the airport and he said, oh yeah, I was just, it was a Tuareg guy. He said, oh yeah, I was just with my family at this play and, and I, I know where you were. And uh, it was actually kind of a, a kind of very kind of uplifting communal, intercommunal event. And you don't think of that kind of a thing as CVE necessarily, but um, the impacts are, are similar, I think. Um, I got a, a word from Vivek. Yes, okay. That was very subtle. Uh, <laughs> for one more question. Maybe we can squeeze two in if we, if we take them together and you, we could turn back to you. Yes, the gentleman there and the lady here. <laughs> so my question is about promoting democracy and countering violent extremism. So in a place like Tunisia where we've seen violent, extreme and, violent extremism increase exponentially since the Jasmine Revolution, you know, it warrants the question, is there a trade-off between democracy promotion and violent extremism? And if not, then how do we promote democracy while also stopping a repeat of kind of the events that happened in Tunisia and countries like it? Can I take that last one? Yeah. Lady, oh, oh. Hi, Anthony Garrett from Internews. We're very proud of the work we've done all over the world, particularly Africa, on supporting moderate voices, and I was wondering if you could say something more about what, how you define CVE and what is not CVE. Yes. Um, so, you know, the, the reality is that violent extremism spreads dramatically in both democratic and non-democratic countries. Um, just ask the Egyptians. And um, our view is that that the, the long-term future for the repression of uh, populations is not good when it comes to violence, period. Um, and certainly that it creates vulnerabilities that are easily exploited. I mean, I think if you look at the history of how violent extremist groups spread, particularly if you take sort of the seminal example of how Daesh moved from being, you know, a movement within Syria to suddenly sweeping across, of Iraq, across Iraq, it was a sense of political disenfranchisement, that the state no longer represented those, and that Daesh could appeal to these people because their government was a bigger problem than Daesh. So, you know, our own view is that, that violent extremism can penetrate any society, but that non-responsive governments or that abusive governments are um, not a good recipe for combating violent extremism. So that is to say it's not democracy per se, it's not elections per se, it's the quality thereof. And I think that is what is so important about the CVE dialogue because it introduces, if you think about counterterrorism as being a conversation between governments where we say, we have a common enemy and we're gonna fight them. And you think of CVE as being a conversation that says there is a common problem and you have to think about how your actions contribute to that problem or help solve the problem. I think those are qualitatively different discussions at the, the bilateral level. And so um, I don't think there's, there's any singular recipe for, for grievance and the spread of violent extremism, but I think it's pretty clear that, that a lack of ability to, sh to participate in political life or to feel that one's political life respects one's individual or one's community are, are things that make people more vulnerable to violence and therefore not good. Um, in terms of moderate voices, I mean, the, the, the basic distinction that the U.S. makes is between those who promote violence and those who don't promote violence. And again, I've tried in my remarks to, to really stay away from this question about um, you know, teleological aspects of faith and focus instead on actions. If you're a parent, you say, you know, I, I uh, 
I love you, I don't like what you're doing, right? And so it's the same thing about you can have your faith, but I don't want you to be violent. And so I think the, the key there really, even though you're right, we do use the word moderate, um, I think the, the, the key distinction for the purposes of this broader fight is violence. And so I think that's the, it's the nonviolent element regardless of whether or not you know, you believe in a jihad or you would characterize yourself as a Salafist. I think the key thing is whether or not you would see violence as a legitimate means to an end and whether you're a Christian who thinks that violence is legitimate means to an end to your teleological goals, it, it, it's equally problematic. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, uh, should we, okay, should we, we'll, we'll take the last one uh, quick, quick, uh, because she was, passed over. Hi, uh, Shaw Baum from the Fund for Peace, and I would like to th thank you for your time and your expertise on the topic. I had two questions. The first one being, um, when you said that organizations are reluctant to change their programs to adopt a, a CV, CVE approach, if that is due to funding or grant issues, or if it goes deeper into organizational missions and goals don't reflect that goal currently. And a second question, one, one? one, okay, one. So I think, I think there are some organizations for whom the term CVE is really problematic and I will admit to not, it's not my favorite term either. Um, I personally much prefer the Secretary General's Preventing Violent Extremism um, taxonomy. Um, but the, I think for some people, the language suggests a securitization of aid or a securitization of humanitarianism. Um, and I just don't see it that way at all. I see humanitarian principles penetrating what is otherwise a security conversation in a way that is really powerful and essential for the future of the planet and our own security. And so um, I, I think part of it is the language and I think part of it is that, um, that, that People sometimes, I think, misconstrue protection of a core mission with, with, um, with rejecting uh, alternative ways to accomplish that mission. Um, and so I'm hopeful that over time, then through conversation, that that will change. But I think it remains a barrier to some degree now. And we are at time. Um, Thank you so much, Jennifer. Panel. Thank you so much for coming over. For the 1st of August, this is a great group we've had here. Uh, so thanks so much for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. We, we hope we can circle back with you. We will look forward to reading your reports. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you. The pressure's on. Great. Well, that, that was terrific, and I do hope we can um, uh, persuade her to come back uh, down the line um, and hear some of the follow-up from what we're doing and, and what, what the, the State Department's been able to accomplish. We're going to turn now to Tiffany Lynch. Um, uh, Tiffany is a longtime friend of CSIS. She's a senior analyst, policy analyst at the U.S. Uh, Commission for International Religious Freedom, uh, has done a lot of work on Nigeria over the years, but uh, well beyond. Um, it's actually Tiffany who came to us with the thought of, of organizing this roundtable and looking at some of the questions, um, kind of getting expert people around the table to look at some of these questions, 
And actually, the commission is, is commissioning uh, a, a s shorter reports um, that will feed into that process as well. Um, so, Tiffany, why don't we be with you, and then we're going to turn to Terry Ostevo, who will... Uh, um, well, thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, CSAS, for, for organizing this event. And um, I want to thank the Undersecretary for her, her very insightful remarks. I'm going to start a little bit about uh, speaking about you know, the general overview of religion in Africa and then how we at the Commission see religious extremism um, spreading throughout the continent. And then looking at some of the responses that we've seen, governmental, uh, societal, and international responses. And then I'll conclude with some recommendations. Um, so first, about religion in Africa. As many of you are aware, uh, religion is conspicuous throughout African society. You see churches and mosques everywhere. Um, prayer is highly devoted and, and, and very um, faithful in terms of, of fulfilling their, their tenets. Um, as we had heard earlier, religious polls show that religion is amongst the primary motivators for many Africans. Uh, 2009 Afrobarometer poll, 81% labeled religion very important. Few found that to be even higher at 90%. Um, and so in addition to the strong degree of faith within African society, we see faith being very diverse. Um, not only do we have strong Islamic and Christian communities that compete with each other, but there's a lot of competition within, and a growing competition within these faiths between evangelical and Pentecostal Christians as populations growing, increasing uh, fellowship of conservative forms of Islam. And within these newer communities, what's interesting is we've seen that these groups place even greater importance on the role of religion in their lives and the role of religion in society and the role of religion in government. So coupling with this growth of diverse, diverse religious actors, we know that religion is growing on the continent. Uh, Pew just earlier this year, last year, found that um, Christianity and Islam is expected to grow t by twice the number of followers by 2015 on the continent of Africa. And that even though Christians are supposed to remain the highest proportion of religious followers, the percentage of growth within Islam is increasing at a higher rate than the Christianity. So we'll see even stronger competition between religious communities in the continent. So I think it's important to have this broad frame of mind when we look at Africa and religious extremism and religious fellowship in the, on the continent, that we have a really growing, strong marketplace for religion within the continent. And how do these factors impact religious extremism? You know, good interfaith uh, interfaith and interfaith relationships amongst the communities. And this is what we're going to be grappling with, not just extremism, but relationships between and within religious communities going forward. So at the commission, we have been following Africa for more than 15 years since we started in 1999. And we've seen these changes in a number of our reports. 10 years ago, we only reported on three countries, Eritrea, Nigeria, and Sudan. Since then, we have also added the Central African Republic, Ethiopia, Kenya, Mali, and Somalia to the number of countries that we report on, that we monitor, that we advocate for improved religious freedom conditions. And I think most of this, as we will see, is because of the expansion and the growth of religious extremism on the continent. So when we look at religious extremism in Africa, we obviously think of the most visible and violent acts. We look at Al-Shabaab in Somalia, now in Kenya, Boko Haram in Nigeria and Lake Chad, the myriad of groups in Mali and now expanding or executing attack in neighboring countries. And these groups have had a profound impact on religious freedom in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Al-Shabaab, they've killed Christian converts, destroyed Sufi shrines, assassinated government officials and those working with them, labeling them as apostates implementing a strict interpretation of Sharia law and corresponding Hadood punishments on its followers, and in neighboring Kenya, executing some of the most horrific and bloody attacks, as we've seen with the Westgate Mall and Garissa University attacks. In Boko Haram, they've attacked churches um, during worshiping, um, systematically destroyed churches throughout the Northeast, forcefully converted Christians, attacked mosques in the Northeast, predominantly, most recently, during Ramadan and Eid celebrations. 
attack Shia worshipers during Ashura, and have also assassinated and killed persons engaged in what it deems as an Islamic behavior. And in Mali, we are all familiar with the destruction of historic Sufi shrines and texts, and again, another impl groups implementing a strict interpretation of Sharia and Hadith punishments. So in addition to these, this violent um, religious extremism that we are all familiar with, at Yusuf we've seen a quieter expansion of religious extremism. And what we mean by that, these are sort of a reduction in communal relationships between Muslims and Christians, increased lack of trust between religious communities, decreased dialogue between religious communities, increased use of rhetoric to insert the, insult the other and the other's tenets. Um, you know, for instance, we document these concerns in Nigeria where the Nigerian Interreligious Council, the overarching um, interreligious body that's led by the president of the Christian Association of Nigeria and the Sultan of Sokoto, it didn't meet for multiple years because of a lack of trust and because of um, a disinterest in dialogue between the individuals. We have heard Christians in Nigeria refer to all Muslims as Boko Haram. We've heard Muslims refer to Christians as infidels. Even in the Central African Republic, which has not encountered terrorism, we hear Christians connect Muslims to Boko Haram or a broader jihadist network. And what we see is worrying is that a recent Pew poll found that 40% of African Christians in a number of countries consider Muslims to be violent, a direct impact that we see of violent groups on the community and on the countries. And then we also see, not only between Muslims and Christians, a real disconnect within faiths. Um, concerns about reduced interfaith dialogue, concerns about hate speech within the communities. So we also hear Muslims are very concerned about extremism within their, country, within their community and within their faith, more so than they are necessarily about extremism from the other side and vice versa. Christians concerned about Christian extremism as opposed to Muslim extremism. So within these various areas of extremism that we have encountered throughout our years, we've seen also a number of governmental responses to try to address this. And from the commission's perspective, we found a number of these initiatives to be faulty and to infringe on an individual's religious freedom rights um, as set forward within their national covenants on freedom of religion or belief and other human rights standards. So one response has been the wholesale targeting of religious or ethnic communities. Um, an arrest um, of supported or, or, or supported membership or, or support of religious extremist groups. You know, we've seen this in Kenya related to Somalis and Muslims on the coast in Northeast Nigeria. We've also seen governments promote particular religious interpretations over all their, their citizens, usually promotion of what the government views as an indigenous or a tolerant form, usually of Islam. And we see this in Ethiopia, which I think Terry will be speaking about um, with the promotion of the Alabash interpretation of Islam and um, through trainings and through um, sort of co-option of the umbrella or Islamic umbrella organization and institutions. We also see governments propping up religious umbrella organizations um, and interfaith bodies. Again, the Ethiopian Islamic Affairs Supreme Council and the Nigerian Interreligious Council. And then we also, more recently, this past year, and we hear about murmurings in a number of other countries, states trying to institute religious registration laws to monitor um, the certification, the qualifications of religious leaders, and to monitor hate speech. Kenya proposed one in January, and it was roundly criticized by Kenyan religious leaders, and it was um, shelved. The Kaduna state governor is one currently under review. It was initially announced in March, in February and March, and it again garnered criticism and is still considered for review. And then this past year, we've seen a number of burqa bans in Western African countries. So even with this, we, you know, I like to take a positive view. We do see some very heroic acts by individuals to counter religious extremism, individual acts, but also we see a proliferation of efforts by religious leaders and by non-governmental actors to, to settle this. Um, and positively still, most Christians and Muslims, the vast majority describe members of the other faith as tolerant and honest. Um, and I'd just like to say that 
going forward, one of the big challenges is how do you connect these local initiatives, these local religious leaders, and these local NGOs with states? How do you encourage dialogue between them? And so it's not a state down, but a bottom-up approach. And then how does the U.S. government and others support these efforts in a way that is um, that has grassroots support? And some of the programs USERF has recommended has been increased support for education, and education reform, including religious freedom and interfaith dialogue at all levels, all grade levels. Increased opportunities for inter and importantly intrafaith dialogue. Support for documenting and countering hate speech in lines with um, respect for freedom of speech rights. Increased counter radicalization and de radicalization programs. And most importantly, not just a military approach, which we see in a number of countries, but how do you undertake holistic? governance and developmental responses to violent extremism. Thank you. Well, if you are not always familiar with Africa, um, just the vast majority of, uh, in countries and the vast majority of history, uh, you have a phenomenally uh, tolerant and inclusive uh, societies within, in which uh, uh, Islam and Christianity have, have lived side by, by side uh, within the same families. And one of the remarkable things about Nigeria was, despite all the prov provocations of bombing, bombing churches or bombing mosques and so forth, um, you, you didn't really have this mass, you, you've seen trends obviously, but it, it didn't uh, turn into this uh, mass populist antagonism between Muslim and Christian communities. Um, it actually pre pre uh, remained quite resilient in that way and overall tolerant. And, and so you do see pockets of it, but just, uh, just to put this in, which is troubling, but to put into a broader perspective, I think also is, is really important that they have remained remarkably uh, stable and uh, uh, respectful. Terry, it's for you now. U.S. policymaker uh, from a non-governmental, you know, throwing ideas out, and perhaps you can share some of your thoughts on uh, what you've seen as you look at the Horn and the coast, where you think the United States and others uh, might go wrong. <laughs> Uh, and where you think they might go right. This is not. Okay. Sure. Um, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me and um, thank you for coming. Um, much of what I like to speak about has been covered already, so I'll try not to repeat myself too much. But I'd like to talk a little bit about trends focusing on the Horn of Africa and Eastern Africa, and then talk a little bit about responses that has um, that have been, been made towards uh, religious extremism and, and point to some of the dilemmas, and if I have time, um, give some, some comments on possible, possible ways out. I think, first of all, it's important to, to underline that uh, religious extremism in Africa is not the m main features of African Islam, if you talk about Islam, it's an exception. The vast, vast majority of African Muslims are not engaged in any kind of act, violent activities. Uh, that doesn't mean that it's not there, uh, but I think that's a very important uh, uh, something to, to be mentioned. And then secondly, when we talk about uh, what is happening, again, focusing on Horn of East and, and East Africa, is that yes, it's, it's clear that what we are seeing are part of broader religious discourses in plural, because even those discourses are not monolithic. There is a lot of, of, of variation in terms of, of what drives these things ideologically. And then also important to underline is that obviously should be that um, these, these are issues that is also connected to local um, to more local problems and, and dimensions. And I want to give some few examples on, on, um, on this uh, to kind of see how, how, what kind of local issues in Horn and East Africa do we have that are important to understand this. Um, and I, 
before that, I also want to underline that we should not reduce uh, extremism as its result of poverty or unemployment. I mean, we have to recognize there are uh, ideological uh, issues at stake at stake, um, we, we have to acknowledge that people do things where they, they see themselves as acting on behalf of God, so to speak. And, and uh, we have to think that these are questions related to, to identity, questions of loss, uh, that is not only uh, of, of a economic character. So it's, 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 it's complex, obviously. We move to Horn. The, the, you know, Somalia, of course, is is obvious in in you know driving much of the instability and the violence we see uh, on the Horn. So um, there has been repeated um, prophecies been made that Al Shabaab now is going to die, but they keep popping up again and again. What we see about Al Shabaab, though, in the last few years, is that. Their, their, the way of operation has shifted from a more, I wouldn't say conventional warfare, but you know, they're less organized with having massive attacks and controlling territory. It's shifted more towards a more kind of, I don't know, uh, classical terror uh, way of, of acting to car bombs, suicide bombings, and more sporadic attacks, which of course reflects um, that they are weakened, but I think we shouldn't write them off as, as going to wither away in the near future. Um, and again, we don't. This is a clandestine movement. We don't know much, too much about what is going on within the inner circles. People talk about the divided between like internationalist traction and then a more local one. I think it's actually more complicated than only like a dichotomy of, of two two sides. Um, but it's also noticeable is that they have, in spite of being weakened. Uh, they actually have been able to make broader impact on the regions. Uh, and this is something which we see clearly in, in Kenya, um, um, where uh, there has been an increased recruitment um, towards Al-Shabaab and Al-Shabaab affiliated groups. I don't know if you can talk about groups uh, as such. But uh, Westgate attacks, Garissa attacks, and repeat attacks in 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 north north uh, eastern region um, has shown that it's there's a spillover uh, effect from Somalia. And then we also see that um, not only are ethnic Som Somalis in Kenya recruited, but also uh, Muslims from a non-Somali background, and that is uh, something to to be noted. Um, and and Al-Shabaab has been active in the recruitment of using Kiswahili language um, in, in trying to gain support. And that is, that is a new development. Um, and, and of course, this, this, you know, the Somali uh, community has a long history of, of grievances towards the central uh, Kenyan government going back to the 1960s, but also the, the coastal uh, Muslim community has also a long history of, of feeling uh, marginalized uh, by the central authorities. So you have this kind of, of local discontent, you know, kind of with from the local, uh, from the coastal community and the Somali community now come, kind of coming together, so to speak. Um, uh, Sansibar, then Tanzania, but particularly Sansibar, um, a similar kind of increase in attacks. Very few are being reported because they're not significant enough. Uh, acid attacks that we, we heard about from the undersecretary. Um, and then also um, an increased communication with uh, actors in Zanzibar on the mainland in Tanzania, and then also with actors in Kenya and Somalia. So we see this kind of similar spillover to a lesser extent than in Kenya, but it's still, it's still there. And then, of course, Zanzibar is particular. And, I, and here is it's so many layers of, of issues that feeds into to what we, I think, too often uncritically are labeling as religious, religious extremism. Um, the, the island identity versus mainlander um, 
coming, taking jobs, and so on. The tourism industry is changing, you know, how people act and behave and dress and so on. All these are feeding into uh, the broader question where San Sebarians always have wanted a greater uh, extent of autonomy from, from, from the Union, from the mainland, Tanzania. So these are also things that, you know, if you want to address the question, the problem, you got to consider all these dimensions that are taking place. And lastly, Ethiopia, where we, I mean, the big brother on the horn, we haven't seen any attack, significant attack. Uh, and we haven't seen, I argue, uh, any kind of radicalization uh, among the Muslim population. However, the Ethiopian government strongly believes that is happening, has been taking some strong measures um, uh, towards that. When we talk about, how am I doing with, how much time do I have? You're doing fine. Okay. When we talk about responses, we can, so far we can divide this into like two main type of confidence. We can, we can talk about hard intervention or soft interventions. You know, this hard one would be like, you know, uh, using military force, using the security sector and so on. And then soft component would be what we talk about in CVE of winning hearts and minds uh, and working with, with local communities. Um, the hard intervention has been much, uh, particularly obvious in Kenya, um, post Westgate, uh, the attack on Westgate, Westgate Mall, but also on the attack on Garissa University, um, and where the Kenyan government has established um, uh, anti-terror police unit, ATPU, uh, which has been becoming famous, uh, where they allegedly, and I think there are pretty good evidence to confirm that they've been engaged in, in assassinations of, of clerics uh, and unwanted uh, Muslim actors, particularly on, on the coast. And the second uh, intervention uh, the Kenyan government did was this so-called Usulama Watch from April 2014. Uh, where they uh, basically did a racial profiling of Somalis, rounding them up and, and then in, in the main stadium. I don't know how many thousands were kind of stopped and, and, and interrogated and, and, and put to prison. But the, 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 what happened was, of course, uh, anger from the local Muslim, uh, Muslim Somali community towards this. Um, and I think it wasn't the smartest thing to do, so to speak. Um, most of, of East African, Horn of African government has not really been interested or engaged in so-called soft interventions. Um, this has mainly been outsourced, if we can use that word, to NGOs and, and other groups. Um, Tanzania is expressing interesting, um, in, increasing interest in engaging in that. An exception here is Ethiopia. We mentioned the Al Habash uh, campaign, which um, started in 2011, where the uh, Kenyan, uh, Ethiopian government invited this obscure organization from Lebanon and invited them and initiated a campaign where um, Lebanese trainers, together with government officials, were you know tra traveling across, across the country and. And, and teaching um, what kind of Islam people should believe in. And of course, this backfired pretty soon, and uh, from January 2012 until August in 2013, we saw almost weekly demonstrations uh, in the main capital. Uh, but the, the main point here was, you know, like I said, to, to tell Ethiopian Muslims that you should be moderate according to whatever uh, they mean by that, that word. And then another third thing, of course, which has been both helpful but also problematic, and, and that is legislation that has been passed by um, almost all the countries in East Africa and Horn and the anti-terror legislation. It has been proven helpful to enabling the governments to, to arrest and prosecute um, um, people that has been uh, uh, engaged in violent activities. But another issue is that terrorism is, is or terror attacks uh, are defined pretty broadly in the sense that they include this, this clause of incitement to terrorism is 
then you can prosecute people who incite to terrorism. What does that mean um, is another problem, another issue. Um, some of the dilemmas here is in, on, on, on the responses by local government. Um, first of all, there's an obvious connection, a complicated one though, between what we can call exclusivist rhetoric or hateful speech and violent activities. Um, we have seen this here in this country, we've seen it in Europe, uh, where some politicians, without mentioning names, has been engaged in anti-immigration rhetoric, anti-Muslim rhetoric, and what we have seen is an, an, an increase in attacks on Muslims, both in the US and in Europe. Now, obviously, we cannot arrest those politicians and prosecute them uh, for, because, you know, they, they don't tell that people should go up and, and beat up Muslims. Um, but this is what happened often in, in East Africa or elsewhere in East Africa, is that the people uh, who are not necessarily talking about saying, di directly are talking about you should go out and blow yourself up in, in a car bump or something, are being arrested. Um, and I have a friend personally who was sentenced to 22 years in, in prison in Ethiopia for, I argue that he actually was advocating for a secular principle. But there's this dilemma here of, okay, you have hateful speech that nobody wants, you have exclusive rhetoric uh, that people are engaging in, and it doesn't necessarily mean that this will be translated into violent activities. It's extremely complicated. How do you kind of draw the line here between prosecution and, 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 and then uh, and, and not? When do, you, when do you say this is something we cannot really put in the category of, 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 um, of, of leading to violence? I think the dilemma we have is that we cast, many of the local governments are casting the net a little too wide in, in, in the sense that people that would not be automatically linked to, to violent attacks are being targeted, and that has this counterproductive effect of creating more discontent uh, among uh, Muslim communities. Um, and the same thing is, is with, with the, the anti-terror laws. Um, not only the clause of, of incitement to terrorism is problematic, but even more so how local governments are deliberately using them uh, to not only to indict and prosecute uh, Muslims, but any kind of unwanted opposition, including journalists and so on. And we see this, this happening. It, come, it kind of becomes a very uh, convenient tool to break down or crack down on, on on unwanted opposition. Um, and also the dilemma with the hard components is that um, um, they, like different sectors of the security apparatus becomes very convenient and very effective tools for the government to secure their own power and are deliberately used by governments in doing so. Um, the ATPU is a very good example. It was kind of very closely connected to, to the Kenyan government. Um, another problem is that many of those um, various sectors of the military, of the police, are going very far in their use of violence. Uh, they are often very corrupt. And, 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 and this, again, of course, creates a dilemma when we talk about soft interventions or CVEs, you know, the hand that slaps becomes the hand that gives. It creates this uh, um, image problem for, for, um, for the local government. So on the one hand, you have your police that goes out and indiscriminately uh, target people uh, without, in the base, without having any base on, in, in law and order, and then you're supposed to go out and, and talk to the same people who are being targeted by your own police. So this is, um, this is uh, a major, major dilemma, and that does not really only affect uh, local governments, but also affect governments like the U.S., uh, who has 
been very active in training the anti-terror police unit in Kenya together with the EU. And of course, uh, uh, the Western support for the security sectors uh, in countries like Ethiopia and Kenya and so on is something that all Muslims know about, that the U.S. and the West is behind all this, so indirectly they, ha they hold the Western government accountable. So then again, I, I really appreciate the Under Secretary's um, um, comments on, on their new approach, but believe me, there's a serious image problem in whatever Western governments and local governments are doing because of the history of, of such hard interventions. Um, so I think, you know, um, if, I, if I could, I mean, the sector's not here, but, but to give some recommendations is that I think uh, a country like U.S. have to put clearer conditions on uh, its support to the security sector. They have to be more diligent in terms of, of securing that the police and the military and so on are acting in accordance with law. They need to be more diligent in, in, in dealing with issues of corruption and, and bad management of, of these forces. Um, if we don't do that, whatever thing we want to do in CVE or the more soft side becomes basically meaningless. Um, and I also think that when we talk about the soft uh, interventions, it needs to be done in very close cooperation with, uh, with uh, local communities and the local governments. Now, the Undersecretary uh, stressed uh, the problem and the difficulties in, in addressing good local partners, uh, and that is problematic. Too often we see that so-called so official bodies, such as you know, SUPCAM, the Supreme Council in Kenya, and Bakwata in, in Tanzania, are very much um, co-opted by, by uh, the, the various governments, and hence have lost much of the credibility they have in the eyes of, of the government. But I think here we need to stop talking about good Muslim, bad Muslims. We need to stop talking about you have either moderate or mainstream, and then you have the extremists. There's a continuum here. And I think we can, we can easily find very conservative scholars of Islam, very conservative Muslims um, that we as Western would disagree with, but who would not necessarily be, be people who would commit violence. So we have to see things in a broader perspective in, in, a, in a very more nuanced, nuanced manner. And working with local governments, I think we need to be aware that there are deeper and broader structural political questions that also needs to be addressed. Like, for example, the, the question of autonomy of, of Zanzibar, the grievances uh, from the local coastal Muslim population in Kenya. I mean, these are, you cannot just talk about CEE as a separate thing. You have to also be willing to address and press local governments to deal with those more, um, and more um, uh, deeper questions. Uh, the other secretary um, questioned whether uh, one need more fine-grained uh, knowledge about what is going on. Uh, yes, we do. We definitely need more fine-grained knowledge. Uh, these are incredibly complicated issues. And I think also what we also need is more knowledge about and then continuous analysis of the CVE approaches, what works, what does not work. And I think this, listening to, to the new strategy that has been, been, been launched, I think this is a great opportunity to, and I think, and I think the, the State Department should take advantage of, of starting to have continuous evaluations and studies of their own approaches so we can actually learn uh, what is working and what is not working. I think I stopped there. Thank you so much. I know we're almost at time. Um, happy to take some questions here. Yes, sir. Uh, Seiku Jackson, Sheriff of Consulting, formerly of Homeland Security. I actually had two questions. <clears throat> In terms of making an off-ramp for kind of um, for active fighters and people in 
El Shabaab or Boko Haram and different groups like that. What are some of the initiatives that work in uh, greater Africa? Because I, I worked in the Middle East and um, we had literally no success it was <laughs> different initiatives to get um, people who were in, you know, Jabhat al-Nusra or al-Isla or in, in different groups there to kind of reintegrate it back into society. Um, that, that was my first question. And also, did you get a lot of pushback in terms of standardizing uh, imams and kutbas and things like that in some of the African countries as there's been pushback in greater Arabia? In standardizing, you mean the countries that tried to standardize a, a particular uh, strand? Yeah. 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 We are going to. We want our sanctioned imams giving the lectures because yeah. part of the problem is we have rogue people who go out and right. whip up people into, you know, a firestorm, and then they go out and commit terror acts. Right. So they said we're going to standardize that. But I was wondering how how does that work in Africa in some of the African countries? Well, I don't. I don't know how widely spread it's done. I know in Niger, for example, they will welcome. Uh, imams from, including Salafist imams, but they make a commitment not to preach violence, they, and they are registered, and they are kind of vetted by kind of a, a, a council to some extent. Um, one of the things, and uh, uh, Dr. Sewell mentioned um, Morocco and going in and, and kind of teaching how to teach, and uh, the head of the Niger uh, Islamic Council said to me, you know, the problem with that is that it was, it's doctrinal. And so he, they're, they're preaching a particular line, not a way to behave. And we have imams who are trained all over the place, Egypt, Saudi, you know, M Morocco, uh, wherever. Um, and so we don't want to say, okay, this is the right way and that is the wrong way. But can we, can we start thinking about, and this is the controversial guy, the head of the Islamic Council, but can we start thinking about kind of a, a Republican imam? What are the basic principles when you engage with your followers? Not the doctrinal principles, but how is it that you engage? So, but I think th that kind of registering and monitoring, of course it can run into all kinds of problems, I think, and that, and that was the backlash in, in Ethiopia um, as well. Anyone else want to take that? Um, well, we have seen some backlashes, Jennifer mentioned, in Ethiopia with the, um, the promotion of the Alabash. It, you know, as Terry had mentioned, it led to large-scale protests for a year, year and a half. Um, unfortunately, the Ethiopian government just really muscularly shut down all the protests and arrested the leaders of that protest community um, and has frightened most of those people who were opponents of that program into um, sort of quiet submission. So they've, they succeed in doing that, but there continues to be quiet disagreement and pushback against that. Um, we do see, as I mentioned in my presentation, Kenya and, and in Kaduna State in Nigeria efforts to create these registration laws. And included within these registration laws is um, certifying clerics, Muslim and Christian clerics. And it leads to questions, you know, who does the certification? How do you certify? Do you certify based on interpretation, theology, education? You know, there are a lot of questions um, which aren't thought out. And in particular, there isn't a lot of interaction and dialogue with the community about how these, how these laws would be put forward and implemented. And, and because of that, um, right now, they've been you know, pushed aside, I think, for a later date. I, in particular in Kenya, it's been pushed aside. I think in, in Nigeria, we'll, we'll see it coming up again relatively soon. Um, but these are, you know, dialogues that are ongoing. And you hear from, you know, in particular in Nigeria, from you know, the Muslim community, there's a real strong effort by some of the senior leadership there to undertake some sort of registration system, some sort of education system, like a real understanding and, and cognizance that they do have, that there is, um, you know, a degree of, of violent extremism within their community, they want to bring it back in. And again, questions are how do you do that and how do you do that that is productive? Your, your first question, what about, you know, in you know, the process of de-radicalization, I understand, you know, how do we turn people from, we don't know much about what has been going on, at least, I mean, the result of, of these, what I do know from, from, from Somalia is that the last half year or so, the 
the, the Somali government has offering amnesty towards um, al-Shabaab fighters, but I'm not aware that they have any, any program for de-radicalization of them. It's more like, hey, put down your guns and we'll be okay. Um, but I think, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people join these movements. So I think it's very difficult to have like one program. Yeah. Um, I mean, some join for the money uh, and others for more ideological reasons. But uh, the question, of course, is there are so much, so many issues at stake here that needs to be addressed that is not only by de-radicalization some certain individuals. You need to address a broader, you know, structural question as well. Yeah, I just really quickly wanted to add a, uh, echo what Terry said about um, being, understanding, having a nuanced position about why people join these groups. Because if you don't have that nuanced understanding of the various causes, if it's economic, if it's ideological, if you're forced into it, if it's, you know, they if it's because of marriage a, fees. Right, right. If there's some sort of connection with the, you know, the same community as you have the community, you're fighting for something broader, you're not going to really develop a, a successful program to de-ramp unless you have a program that targets a specific reason why somebody joined in the first place. Um, and we ha I haven't seen a country develop that full nuanced off-ramp, as you called it. I, I do think Nigeria was kind of promising in that regard, right. in that, I mean, they were thinking uh, bigger, they were thinking post-traumatic stress uh, for some of the uh, women who had been returned, some of whom had been indoctrinated, some not. Um, it's just not a really politically popular or palatable uh, program to take on. Uh, when these are perpetrators as well as, in many cases, victims. And, um, you know, the whole transitional yeah. justice of that and what the communities yeah. feel, uh, that's a very tricky thing. Yeah, I mean, sometimes well, you have to think of it as sort of a DDR approach as well, right? right? right. You know, not just the counter radicalization de radicalization off-ramp, how do they interact with community yeah. once they go back? And that's also not fully thought out, particularly in Nigeria where you have um, very local uh, antagonism against former Boko Haram fighters, you know, women who were kidnapped, um, people who were forcibly conscripted into it. If, you know, they might not have wanted to join Boko Haram, they were forced into it, but they are tainted and, uh, and rejected. Uh, yes, sir, and then I think we are at time. I have to cut you off again, I'm sorry. <laughs> you did get one in. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Nathan Weininger. I'm with the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative. Um, my question is, in these sort of interfaith dialogues, are there any conversations about conversion and how to do conversion without sort of inciting violence? I think conversion is a very important part of both Christian and Muslim faith traditions, and it's something that as Westerners, when we show up and talk about interfaith dialogue, we just don't touch, as far as I can see. Uh, um, well, I imagine that it's a pretty sensitive thing in an interreligious dialogue. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the one thing I've heard about religion, and this talks a little bit to some of the more, the newer groups that are coming on board and challenging traditional hierarchies, whether they're Muslim or they're Christian, um, there's a lot of resentment against kind of the proselytizing. Um, you know, the Catholic Church has been in Senegal, which is a 95% Muslim country, for years. The first president was a Catholic for 40 years. They are most concerned not about uh, reformist Muslims, but about Pentecostals coming in with very loud kind of proselytizing parties and language that kind of starts the us-them uh, rhetoric. Um, and they're like, you know, the Senegalese associate them with us because they're Christians, and but it's also beginning to kind of tear rifts within the social fabric. So that's just a whole fascinating angle to, to look at, but not one that I can say I've looked at a, a great deal. I, I can speak to about a little bit in Nigeria, in the Middle Belt, in Kaduna, and, and, in, and in Joss in particular, which are two cities which are, you know, highly balkanized. And the use of, you know, when I was speaking about hate speech, this is part of it. Um, part of it is, you know, the demonization of the other faith um, because the other one's considered violence, but it's also, you know, in other areas, it's a, you know, an, an effort to convert people into your faith. Um, so it's one of the reasons in Kaduna State there's talk about this registration law, looking at hate speech and, um, you know, 
even evangelicalizing materials, you know, a reduction of it in the public space, a reduction of the use of loudspeakers, you know, driving your car around, a, you know, a, a Christian pastor driving a car around in, in the Muslim area. Um, you know, these efforts, these are evangelizing efforts which create tensions. Um, so you have some state level initiatives that I know about. I'm not really familiar with interfaith efforts that really tackle this strongly. The other thing in all of this is that in so many of these places, religion is just one layer of multiple different things. Microphone. <laughs> one layer of multiple different things going on. And uh, just to end, uh, I, I, story I, I always tell, I was talking about uh, conflict and clashes in Joss in the middle of, of Nigeria. And was it herders versus sedentary farmers? Was it settlers versus indigenous? Um, we did have a Muslim Christian element in it, but I was trying to, on this TV interview, kind of explain it very in a very nuanced way. When I eventually saw what they put up, uh, there was me speaking in a very nuanced way, I thought, and behind me was a map that said Muslim on the top, Christian on the bottom, and a big boom sign in the middle. Um, so uh, there's a lot of simplification of many different grievances, whether they're ethno-nationalist, political, uh, you know, the, the, the settler indigen thing is huge, farmers, herders. Um, and unfortunately, once they take on that religious overtone and undertone, they become very hard to put back in the bottle. And I think it's, it's really important not to conflate religion and extremism and violence um, with those many other issues and really try to, to tackle what is at the very core of it, which often is not ideology at, at, at all. We are at time. I give you one last moment, uh, one last word, if you'd like to wrap it up, or have you said your piece for the day? I can try to think of something. <laughs> no, I think it's very important to underline when we when we um, talk about um, this CVE, which I also don't like really this acronym, is that we shouldn't think that CVE is something that we need to bring to Africa. I think it's very important on the line that CVE um, activities is going on daily done by fathers and mothers and community leaders um, towards in, in local communities. The fact that we don't see religious violence as the dominating feature of Islam shows that there are active CEE programs going on on the grassroots. And I think um, if we are to do something meaningful as outside actors, we need fine grade grained knowledge about these actors and, and, and soberness and accuracy in, in cooperating with them in a very meaningful full, full manner instead of going through, or maybe together with going through more established bodies that often lack the necessary credibility among the grassroots populations. Thank you for joining us and staying with us to the bitter end, as I was saying. Um, uh, we hope you'll join us down the line for future sessions uh, that come out of the roundtables. Uh, we're almost certain to have Terry back, um, back to Washington uh, to talk more about his work on the Horn in East Africa. Uh, the CSIS Africa program is just coming out with a report on violent extremism in the Sahel. So keep your eye out uh, on the website, and uh, we'll look forward uh, to seeing you down the line. Thanks very much.